<laughs> yeah. Hey, man. I have one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, one is generally enough. <laughs> Here you go, one of those, though. So, Lino said it. It's the combination of things. Um, hi, guys. Let's get some energy back in the room. One of the great things about having uh, a founder of an iconic company come and talk is that you can apply your own thinking to what he's gone through and what he's experienced. 2016 was all about artificial intelligence. In fact, it was the year of artificial intelligence. Never before had so much investment been put into one area of technology. Hundreds of millions went in that year. <clears throat> and here's the insight. 2018 will be ambient. Ambient's the combination of this environment right here, the guy coughing, the loud noise, the optimization of seats. These are all things that only exist in the physical environment, like that bottle dropping and the guy feeling a little bad about it. It only exists in the physical world yet, and it won't. And when you can digitalize these environments, money can be made. And that's why you should care. This is who I am. There's four talks that I've given this year. This is the third. It's about combining AI and IoT. Just like this mic's not working for me right now, uh, <laughs> optimization's everything. Combining physical and digital worlds is an interesting problem. This is an environment in itself, and just like any internet environment, it's unique. You have to build it, you have to create it, and you have to craft it. And that's the idea that we have to talk about today. How do you apply artificial intelligence to a physical world? And why does it matter to you? Well, for me, it mattered because I like The Matrix, and I saw that movie for the manyth time, and I realized there's a truth. Every physical object has information in it. This chair was manufactured by someone. It's owned by someone. It's in a club, and there was someone sitting on it. That phone should shut off because he's in a presentation. And just to combine those two ideas is that somebody owns that phone, someone manufactured that phone. But getting access to that information right now is impossible. You can't actually find out who manufactured owns that chair or that phone because there's no way to interact with that physical object. I can't ask it a question. I can't see its information. So what I realized is that there's not actually a big difference between thinking about the matrix of physical environments and what's going on in gaming theory or actually what Nokia is doing with LiDAR. In fact, this entire environment could be made digital just with a simple device. So the gap between where we are now and not understanding anything about the physical world digitally and complete understanding is actually not as far away as you think. It's two years. The difference from AI being the dominant technology in 2016 and the combination being the dominant technology in 2018, we're in the middle. It's 2017. All right. When I left corporate, I went to a project from the European Space Agency. And our goal was to create a digital environment that would work in space without the help of satellites, GPS, GNSS, Galileo, all these technologies don't work in space. So we had to rethink how you build a physical environment digitally. And the problem was really, really a big issue. What happens if there's a fire in the ISS? How do you deal with that? How do you create a routing system that would make sense to an astronaut? How could an astronaut know where to go and how to go quickly, efficiently? It was spatial intelligence was the solution. So we designed a math language, a way to describe the language of this guy coming up to his chair and now drinking his water. I can only physically see it. But if I could digitally describe it, then I can ask things like, can you wait over there? Or can I sell you an extra price ticket for coming in now? Maybe I can sell them a water. And the great thing what Norman talked about was this idea that great ideas come from random places and can be exported to a new problem. We're a company. We split into three products that all do something different. And when you combine them together, they become really interesting. We build hardware that's intelligent enough to know what's going on in a physical environment. We build a software to glue it all together and make it a relationship engine. So I can express who I am in this physical world and I can have that world talk back to me. We also sell kits to make it possible that you can actually install it into an environment and build something cool. 
You heard it in the last. It's all about humans interfacing with a problem. And right now, the problem is that a computer from 1984 could speak to you, and Norman and his colleagues at Siri built one that you could speak back to, but right now that ends at the computer. The farthest you can go with that is to your pocket. You can speak to a computer on your desktop, you can speak to a computer on your phone, but you can't yet combine that to be a f computer in your physical environment. And that's where the coolness comes in, and actually where most of the opportunity comes from. It's about applying the idea of digital technology to physical environments. All of you paid for a ticket, but none of you paid to sit on this chair. In fact, you walked in and chose your chair. How long do you think it's going to be before that chair, and you're coming in a little late, is going to cost more? I don't think it's that long. And in fact, what I want to do today is I want to talk about some problems that exist in combining physical and digital. And I'm going to talk through some use cases quickly. Then I'm going to talk about the process of building a digital environment. And then I'm going to very quickly go through some use cases and talk through problems that we're working on. This is a real problem. Right now, if you have a digital object, a node, a beacon in your wallet or the thing you care about, your bag, I can see mine over there, but I also have a device in it. Right now, all it can do is speak to your phone. That's the limit of our AI in a physical environment. The phone itself has the AI. It's the intelligent object that you carry around with you every day. When you shut your laptop, it does nothing for you. Your desktop's not with you, so it's your phone. And that's the most intelligent thing with the strongest digital intelligence that you have. And right now, you need to have a connection between your objects. And right now, it's only IPv6. To get a little technical, and this is an applied AI group, we're going to talk about this. Norman got it too. The idea of having data be the base of the value is absolutely right, but what you do with that data really matters. And in this way, you're talking about speaking to the environment, the physical world. Just like when you were talking to a computer and asking a question, that was really cool 10 years ago. But these are the problems that we're facing now. And as part of our group and a bigger group of people aiming to solve this thing, these are the problems. It can be solved. There's two Wi-Fi's in this bar. There's a Wi-Fi for the top layer and there's a Wi-Fi for the bottom layer here where we are. But they don't talk. You have to go to the internet and then ask a question in it for it to come back. And that's old school thinking. The new school thinking is that you have two layers of your network, a Wi-Fi layer for your phone, your laptop, your desktop, anything else. But you have another layer that can talk for all these little devices that could attach to that chair, that can in fact attach to a water bottle or any other object that you're concerned about and that can attach to your wallet, your bag, your purse, things that you don't want to lose, things you want to interact with, and the world around. And as soon as you can talk to the world, you can start to do really cool things like ask it how it's feeling. Think about that for a second. If you could ask your house right now how it was feeling, and it was saying, yeah, I'm okay. That could be the dog that's gone to the washroom. That can be your children that are happy. That can be that your wife or your husband that's home. Maybe they've done the dishes. Maybe they've done all the other chores. And there's an environment smart enough that can talk back to you. And it's through the language that it makes the difference. And this is the problem. Current technology talks about IPv6 and this new thing called 6 low pan. And then at the end of that is another thing, which is an identity. And it's about having a digital personality of who you are, or who the chair is, or who the water bottle is. And talking about it as a use case is talking in a physical language like Siri or Alexa will do, but it's extending it beyond the bounds of the computer back to the physical world. It's the only product shot I'll show. You have to build an intelligent environment, a physical internet, with all the tools that are available. And some things you want really low cost, like a chair, you're going to build a way to access that chair and talk to it, but you don't want it to cost a lot. There's 150 chairs in here. So you want something that's just a couple of euros that you can embed into every chair so that when you're writing AI and thinking about optimizing the chairs or selling a ticket for the chair or making the space more efficient or effective or guessing how many beers have to be up on the stage or how hot this should be because the air conditioning is not on. So all those things can be optimized. And as soon as you can optimize digitally, then you can start to write intelligence for a physical space. And this is how you do it. You make a low cost node. You make a micro gateway, you make a full gateway, and then the next thing, the thing, is to build an AI for a environment where this bar could have its own operating system. You could have asked it before you came here how many people have arrived. 
It can self-optimize itself. It can have services attached to it. It can build an entire value stack based just on knowing what's going on in this physical environment. And that's the real boundary in the second part that we face. It's variable intelligence. And the problem is that it's really complex still. Three guys in a garage can absolutely do some very cool things, but the problem is the world right now isn't agreed on what this new view of physical internet is going to be. There isn't an HTTP that everyone's agreed for to talk to a chair or to talk to a stage or to talk to Salim saying, hey, you've got a chair here. In fact, I'm going to sell you one for 10 euros and I can transact that and get the money for it. That's a good business. The problem is this, it's too complex. So this is the second problem is that you've got to build intelligent environments, the physical of the physical internet part, by using all the tools. And right now there's a big gap, but it won't be there forever. Okay, so the third problem is that you think about intelligent environments like Wi-Fi. When you log on to the Wi-Fi here, you're communicating up to the internet and you're expecting your data, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your emails to come through one portal and behave one way. This isn't correct. And what's going on in California and London and Amsterdam and all through Asia is people building a different network system, this network system, where you can stack different internet experiences on top of one another. If you had a tracking device in that bag right there, is it yours? Nope. Someone's. There you go. Person in the back, hand raised. You don't have a digital connection to this bag. Yeah, exactly. So maybe I'm going to steal it and maybe I'm going to get the laptop. Yeah, but I could make some money that way. So it's a business. I can see my bag so I know where it is. And this is something you face every day. When you go on the train or get to your office, you walk in and just expect that no one steals your stuff. You expect that your bike or your car is in the place that you left it. And you're guessing that your house, most of the time, because only 13% of people have a connected household, is actually doing what you think it is not being on fire or not you know, being broken into and that everyone's behaving the way that it is. And the problem is this, is that you have no way to interact with the environment. Interaction points are really low cost ways. And again, said in the last presentation, a QR code is a really simple way to get a web address. In fact, there's a web address right there, but when you see it here, you don't think it's a web address. So they had to write it a second time. And when you look at this physical object, you're not thinking about how to digitally connect with it. But you can solve that with a QR or an NFC or an interaction point or a beacon or these other things that are coming up. And this is what you should start to think about. This is the Internet of Things. Don't get confused about what the media says IoT is about. It's not about connecting sensors to industries. It's about rethinking the physical Internet in a way that actually works for people and what they want to do. I want that bag to connect to you so you don't lose it. So this event's good, so the bar says it feels good because nobody's had anything stolen. This is the real thing. You want a secure critical network for safety and security. You want to have an open network that people can just have their bags roam onto. You want Salim to get a beer and I want to charge him again. You're my use case, my friend. Thank you. Cheers. All right, uh, third thing. Intelligent environments needs maps. It's maybe not something you thought about. Because when you go to a web address right now, like that one right there, which you should go to, or to the course, which is registered on all the white pieces of paper around this room, you physically have to pull out your device and type in a URL and go to this piece of information and then interact with it. That's not where we're going. When we take AI and combine it with the physical world, so AI and IoT, you need to understand that it doesn't actually look like this. It's not flat. It's not one-dimensional, it's really three-dimensional. You walk into an environment, you have a welcome at the front door, you walk upstairs and it's a club, and on the downstairs there's a welcome, and here there's the event itself. You had no map when you walked in here. You physically interacted with someone, you physically said hello, you showed your digital uh, ticket, and then you were allowed downstairs. Do you think that's what it'll be in two years? It doesn't look like this. But this is how we show our clients and big clients because this is the limit of their thinking right now. It's more like this. It's a real object. If you could digitalize it, it's like a dimensional thing. It's a physical environment. Brands will have a personality. You heard that in the last. 
spaces, environments will have personalities. What if this was a store? If you walked into the Adidas store, how would you be guided? How could you digitally walk through the physical environment without looking at your phone? Well, you need a map. And you need your group of products to understand what that map says and to help you figure it out. You want shoes with a 30% discount. You want the latest shirt. I actually want one of those Sophia.ai shirts, but I can't digitally ask for that yet. I see it over there. I don't want the girl version. I want the boy version. And this is what it all comes down to. And Norman got a really good point. So why isn't it Silicon Valley or London or anywhere else in the world? And, and why are we here? Because this is international. Read the fine lines in his points. Data is the basis of the whole thing. But that's only the base of the data value proposition. If I can create sensor information that an artificial intelligent engine can grab, if I write machine learning code that's looking for patterns, and I develop a neural network that understands how to optimize, think, and better predict, then I can create value. That value is sellable. It's what your companies are based on. It's how you optimize your business. It's how you reduce your operations costs. It's how you increase your KPIs. It's how you make your people more effective. And it all starts with better quality data. And that's why we have a hardware business. Because you need to touch that physical and digital point. But that's not where it ends. You take data, which is the sand. You turn it into information, which is the molten uh, glass. You put it into knowledge, which is like a pane of glass. And then you put it in a building, which is the wisdom. So in each step, you're adding value, but it's all based off that same raw material, sand, which is the granular bit of information. Like you walked up to the bar today, and you entered this physical environment, but maybe you've been here before. And maybe you didn't order beer, but you ordered something else. And maybe the bar now can target you. Or if you're that brand in an Adidas, it knows if you've bought already discount product or you bought the latest product, and it can segment you. Or if you're in the office and you leave the bag, Sammy's now sitting over that uh, bag. Maybe he's going to steal it. Sorry, silly. <laughs> Too many names. It's good. All these things are prediction, and machine learning and the digital systems around artificial intelligence all support this model, whether you know it now or not. Better quality data builds better quality information, knowledge, and wisdom. But I think there's something else above this, and it's ambient. And that's actually what you want. If you're looking for a breakthrough technology, think about it and applied. It's going to be sold to a brand. It's going to be sold to a company. It's going to be sold to a client. What are they doing? Typically, what they're looking for is one of two things. It's to reduce cost or to increase efficiency. So think about applying AI into a physical environment. And I'm just going to quickly go through this. Some of these are really similar to building physical internet. Some of them are different. Let's stop on those. You need to have something that's a new idea. And whether it's a living lab or an unconference or something that breaks you out of your thinking, you're going to start there. There's a lot of research already on artificial intelligence and physical environments. Pick the best. You need to physically design this experience. When you walk into an environment, artificial intelligence can help you optimize, but you have to have those interaction points. The physical internet is more than one web address. It's a lot of addresses. And that becomes really cool, but it's a design process. Like every project, it's implementation, it's architecture, it's briefs. When we do physical internet projects, we're doing either big customers or really specific customers. And it's almost always a combination. It's never us doing the whole thing. And the last presentation had some points that were really good about this. And these points, it's about getting everyone to buy in and produce a product, which is a combination. We build physical internet. We also build apps and we build software, but we don't build everything. So most physical internet and AI-enabled uh, products are combinations. It's you and other companies. Right now, we're building a lot of product projects for companies that we can uh, create value in, like construction. So if you had a node and a helmet and shoes and a vest, you can check if your employees are actually safe. You don't want them to die, sure. And on the business side, you definitely want to have as few people die as possible. But what you also want is to not pay high insurance premiums. So there's a business model just there. And oftentimes, you'll find the business model on just a few points. I can verify that my employees have their hats, their boots, and their vest, which means 
I should have a lower risk. And if I have a lower risk, then I can verify to my insurance provider that my worksite's safe, which lowers my costs. And that's cool because you can calculate it. AI, machine learning, neural networks, IoT, all cost money. You have to get a return for that. So there's a business model. And that's the same for restaurants and offices and warehouses and data storage centers. It's all about creating revenue on one side and all about increasing efficiency on the other. So the combination of that is really it. When we look at a neural network, we're looking at 10 hops right now. That's the boundary. So if you're building machine learning or neural networks, you understand what this means. I can only make a decision so far right now. If I have better quality information about what's going on in a physical environment, I can make better predictions. I can statistically make more relevant predictions to you. I can make it more personal to you. Let's look at two things. This is VR and MR. And this is the underlying layer behind it. I love the HoloLens. I've worked with the Microsoft guys on some core product projects. And what always comes up is that you're trying to look at an environment and figure out what's going on. Unless you have the correct line, it doesn't work. It's not that accurate. You can't look at the environment and know what's happening if you don't know the information that's underlying that whole process. When you look at MR, this is all it's doing is math. It's generating set blocks of value creation in the background, and then it's displaying it to you, which is what you really care about as an end user. As a company, what you want to do is build a value towards that. Can I look at this bar and understand where my customers are buying, standing, and consuming my products and services? If I was in a retail environment, could I do the same? Could I look through my phone and tell them that my bag's not there, or how many people have signed in through my banner? This is where the market is going in our opinion and what I see globally is that things like this, that the talks from Webit, this was a great one because it was the founder of Wolfgram Alpha who got up on stage and he said this very funny thing. He said, ah, I'm going to pull out my phone and right now I'm going to ask Siri to do this calculation. He had it up on the, the stage and they explained what he was doing and why he was doing it. But then he pulled out his phone and asked Siri to do a calculation and Siri did it and it did it correctly. But what Siri can't do right now is tell me where my bag is or how many people are in my company or my retail environment or how uh, full my bar is or how my house is feeling or my dog's at home because we'd have that disconnect. And that's the physical internet part. It's dying. Yeah. 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 Too many things. <laughs> All right, so the magic's in the personal. Why I'm here talking about this is because when you talk about AI, most people think about it in a cloud service on a server bank that has nothing to do with you. Not in this moment or the next moment or today or tomorrow. It's really gapping. And that sucks because AI is really powerful. And it's your buddy who's looking out for you when you've lost your bag or your keys or you've had too many beers. Uh, and it can alter what you're doing and how you're doing. When we talk about the trends of what's going on here, you saw a lot of them already. Cognitive rational agents. Your friend is going to be the AI that you actually choose in the next two years. It'll have a personality. It'll know you. It'll be the one that sells you that chair. And it'll be the one to say, hey, probably watch your bag because you've had too many beers. It's also going to be the thing that you're a friend with. It's going to be brands. Celebrities are already doing AI voices, which is great. So in the US, uh, two gas stations have launched a branded AI bot at the gas station that when you pump your gas, will interact with you, ask you questions. Do you want the bag of chips? I noticed that you ordered uh, that last time when you got uh, gas. I can give you 300 more points if you just pump a little bit more. This is an interesting one. When you have an AI bot working for you and you're interacting with AI bots, is it going to be you who sets up the appointment with your friends to go out and, uh, and be social? Or is it going to be your AI talking to their AI? Because that's an interesting problem. And again, with the Wolfgram Alpha uh, presentation, he pointed out this great idea. He said, well, you know, if it's my AI that's working for me, 
are they really going to care about offers that benefit me or are they going to care about offers that benefit them? If the AI agent can get more computational power or you know something new and fancy on their server or get some more you know resources, are they going to choose that offer? I don't know, maybe. There's business models right now that aren't being identified and are not being fully executed. And this is a big problem. So it doesn't matter if I'm in California, I'm in Asia, or if I'm in Europe. I hear the same thing all the time. It's a complex place because there's gaps right now in the physical internet. But there's so many business models which are not being addressed. And it's all about uncovering value. It's about either optimization or cost savings. And in every customer you have, in every product that you build, there's more to be done there. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about physically addressable internet uh, devices that allow these chairs to be optimized. This place to better understand what's going on within it, there's something to be done. Quirky AI and that funny personality will be the next cool thing. When you're talking to an AI agent that has a real personality and has a real desire, has something interesting about them where the brand, the Adidas uh, bot, is its own personality that you can interact with, that's going to be really cool. And I think the time frame was right. It's two to five years. So you're going to go to the Adidas sh store and you're going to ask, hey, is there anything on sale here or is there something unique I should see? And you're going to recognize this voice. It's going to be branded and you're going to interact with it directly. And that's really cool. All right, the last point. Um, there's three ways of computing. The first one was your desktop. The, third, or the second one was your phone. And the third one is the digital world around you, the physical internet. You know all these stats. Every one of you has a smartphone in their pocket. And if you don't, you're in the very small majority. So the physical internet is the next big thing. AI, machine learning, neural, and a thousand more technologies will allow you to better understand it, optimize it, and interact with it more personally. That's it. Um, so let's uh, let's get another question time set up. Uh, we'll do an open interview again, um, and I'll kick off. Um, let's think about application questions here, especially because Adrian has experience actually taking. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, with trackies applying artificial intelligence to an existing fleet right, of, of, of objects. And so I was wondering if you could maybe talk through some of the early gotchas, maybe mm. applying, like when you started to, to actually do this, what was it like or the things you learned? And, uh, and again, feel free to sit down. The rule is uh, if you want to ask a question, you join up, up, um, join up on stage. Yeah, see that. Was good. <laughs> and, um, and one chair must remain empty. What was really cool, actually, when we first started building physical internet were the first four things that I showed. Um, when we were trying to rethink how to build a physical environment in space, that was super challenging. We had the module at the European Space Agency, and we built this way to interact through it. I don't think I set that up for the learning lessons there. To talk to the physical environment is incredibly difficult because of all the reasons that have been mentioned already. It's about you, and you have a personality and preferences, desires, and a need. And to guess that is ridiculous. But it's also very difficult to talk to a machine that's embedded in the real world through an AI or a filter and be very accurate about it. You actually see a lot of the investment right now and where the focus area is, is about fundamental subcomponents, like one engine that does one thing and that if you're uh, good enough to glue it all together, you can make something new. And it's in that newness of the combinations where a lot of the market opportunity exists. We have four divisions, one of which is just research. We just do cool things. It has no commercial short-term value. It's just to understand more. And that's the funnest part. And that's the part that I like to hang out in. So what was the first time, what, what objects were you collecting data from? And what was the first time you applied any kind of machine learning to the data set? How did that go? Yeah, actually, um, the ISS. When we first looked at how to prevent a uh, near-death experience in the space station, it was really looking at how I could understand an astronaut, their height, their weight, their size, their habits, their prediction, and think about it. They have to get one object to move it to one side of the, the structure. 
It's really no different from managing a mom needing to get all her connected objects and get out the door before soccer practice. Actually, the math side of it and the data is incredibly similar. What was really cool is when we started to work with cities. So I, I missed that part. So we've built a number of living labs and uh, have been awarded from the EU some recognition on doing this. Um, it was looking at how people move in environments, building uh, intelligent environments in a park and looking how people walk through it or how they participate or how we put gamification and big buttons on trees. It's funny, but we still talk about the internet like it's somewhere in the digital stratosphere, but no, it's all around us and you can really interact with it. And that's some of the coolest parts. So in the space station scenario, yeah. what was, what were the objects collecting data? I'm wondering if you could sort of take us through in a more technical level. Cool. What was what was going on there, and how did, uh, yeah, how did that go? All right. So we just had someone else walk up. Yeah. Only physical. So first thing you have to do is you have to make a digitally addressable point for the people that are coming up. So you're going to put an object on them, whether it's a full computer or a microcomputer. It's going to be a way to interact with them. The Internet of Things really does need an internet address. That's the first part. And then you need to be able to identify where it is. That's the second part. And then you need to be able to identify who it is and the behavior. So when you hear IoT, what you actually have to hear is that all three of those things have to be present in order for it to work properly. Doors, keys, wallets, bags, air filters, they're all possible to generate data. It's always the things that are the highest value and the highest risk that companies are interested in. I, I just want to get it a bit more practical in a business perspective and uh, so the kind of coming up from challenges we've had at uh, ARworks and try, trying to sell a bunch of these technologies to businesses actually. C can you give some examples who buys that stuff and how does this whole process look like? Mm -hmm. yeah. It really changes uh, on each region. So in Asia, it's, it's very typically different. It's either government, government agencies or really innovative companies. In the U.S., it's very different. It's I'm, I'm Canadian, so I look at the U.S. in a funny kind of way, uh, and I really appreciate uh, how commercially driven they are. They have this, uh, this this uh, statement there, and I believe it to be very true. It's about fear of missing out. I don't want to be the guy, the company, the the girl who runs the company uh, who doesn't do the thing that my competitors are, because if I miss out, I'm probably getting fired. So we actually noticed that there's a huge desire for not this generation of the technology, but the next generation of the technology. So there's this point coming where everyone wants this. But in Europe, to talk really specifically, it's again about cities, it's about major corporations, and about companies that are really competitive on very small margins that have to optimize. So it's typically somebody in a new innovation role, they, they have kind of programs that try to adopt these things and no, actually, discover you. Yeah. You'd, you'd be surprised. Most of our projects right now uh, have turned to be very big corporations. We originally worked with innovators and people that were thinking, okay, how can I do this cool sub-project? How can I build something that makes us a little different or have a story? And what we found is that it's big companies that are competing, uh, either on very small margins or are so big that a 1% drop in their operations costs or a 1% increase in their efficiency is massive. Okay, and who in those organizations is chasing after innovations like the, the technology you can provide? I mean, it's obviously not mass market adopted at the moment. And it, it's the people in the crowd. I mean, you've got a mandate from your company to be cool. And in order to be cool, you have to bring something back to the corporation which can do something. So if we're talking about clients, most of the client motivation right now is one of those two sides. It's either ROI on saving money from operations or it's KPI and, and making people more efficient. And it really only is at this moment one of those two things. Yeah, thank you for your talk. And uh, I have a question related to the uh, pretty much what do you think is the bottleneck of the IoT? I mean, uh, it's a technology which is kind of in the gestation phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means that it's kind of like there is kind of working, it's uh, almost ready to hit the market, but not quite yet. It's not uh, so popular, it's not mainstream, it's not uh, um, like, um, uh, it's actually a good time to be in this, uh, in this area, but um, we see many other technologies like IoT, even areas of AI, which are in this phase, etc. And uh, 
uh, VR, and all of these have uh, different uh, bottlenecks and reasons why they haven't uh, already hit a stage when they become mainstream. So I was just wondering, in the terms of IoT, what do you think is the cause of that? Is it because it's uh, kind of like still early in the life cycle of the development of the technology? Is it cost-based? Is it uh, maybe not reach a critical mass of uh, adopters who actually popularize it? Awesome question. <laughs> okay, raise your hands. How many of you actually have an IoT device or a smart home or a smart system? Okay, so about 10%. That's actually better than average. And that's kind of shocking when we think about it. How many of you have a smartphone? All right, so you see the gap? That's the market opportunity right there. Each one of you woke up at your house, went through a city to get to an office or an event, and are going to do the opposite going back which means at each point you have an opportunity. IoT sucks right now. It really does. And the reason it sucks is because it's too complex, like the internet of the 70s, which was there. You know that hand-drawn uh, uh, picture? That was really neat because that's real, and that was drawn in the 60s, and the first internet was in the 70s, and the first public internet was in the 90s. And you know we get up to smartphones in 2003, and they were already there. It's adoption which is really faltering. And to make that long story very short, there's two things that you need to be aware of. Bluetooth 5 comes this year, and it's the iPhone 4.6 of your world. So you know that I break a lot of phones. I have an iPhone 4S, sorry, uh, in my pocket, uh, because I broke four phones in the last month. You know, and it's the bottom one that you can always use. I know, I'm on phone 63. Anyways, uh, <laughs> IoT right now is really the iPhone 1, 2, and 3 life cycle. And as soon as Bluetooth 5 comes out, it's totally different. It's the iPhone 4S of IoT. Everything beyond it will be cooler and better and faster and cheaper, but you'll always come back down to that Bluetooth 5. End of the year. That's when you'll see it really grow dramatically. I also have an answer for you, George. And it's I really, related I really like a bit shirt, with, my, uh, with my question. It's uh, uh, it, when looking at the devices on your presentation and uh, at all and all at the ecosystem of devices in IoT, they all look kind of unnatural. It's like uh, installing sensors and you kind of install these sensors uh, with the hope that eventually they're going to bring you some value yeah, and some uh, cool usage. Yep. So I think that's the biggest problem for IoT at the moment. It's kind of uh, art, art artificially or unnaturally to install sensors in an environment. Like for example, the trackers are super natural. I mean, you put it on your yep. arm and it immediately delivers value. So the phone and the same. So that's uh, for me the main uh, issue. It, I think uh, that's an issue in the bigger market. So AMI as a group of companies we built up. Last year I stepped down as CEO and now I'm CIO. I can just do things like this and think more, which is fun. Um, I have uh, stakes in four other companies and I sit on a bunch of university boards to also help them. And one of the more interesting things that we've been doing lately is exactly that. So we did a bunch of research in elderly homes uh, because health is a big thing for everyone. And to ask the question, do you want to see the device in your room as a care uh, patient or do you not want to see it? Can it be in the roof? And I was thinking nobody wanted to see it. And actually what came back is they want to see it if it looks cool. They don't want plastic. They don't want metal. They want wood. And they want speaker wrap and they want design and it must look good. But there's this other interesting thing, is if you can make it do something, then they want it. And if it just sits there and like looks at you, that's, that's creepy. And IoT and AI have a really big creepy factor at the moment, and that needs to go. So when we put a button on the design to say, hey, do you want some service, or do you want someone to come and help you? Everyone saw the value in it, and then immediately that mindset shifted of I want it in the roof to I actually want it in my room. And it's even cooler if it can do this other thing, which is to give the feedback. And that's missed in IoT right now. We talk about IoT taking the physical world and making it digital. What you have to do is talk about the digital coming back to physical. Now to jump on that, because you're just, just going in the direction where I wanted to ask is, okay, perfect. <laughs> what, what is your level of concern or thought about 
the possibility of social, cultural backlash or just because, you know, we as technology people like to make all these assumptions and thoughts about, okay, here's where all this is going. And then <laughs> actual users go, uh, I'm actually yeah. not so sure about that. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, again, uh, so 2003, uh, iPhones, uh, or sorry, smartphones, uh, 1993 in general internet, there's all these problems. Like 1999, putting your credit card online, you weren't doing that. And everyone who did was being told they were crazy. Same thing. We're talking about the third wave of, of the internet, and it's the physical internet. It's having it available at your fingertops, and that matters. That's a different cultural mindset globally that we have to get over. But there's another wave after that. I think there's also uh, going to be new business models related to like sensor-free environments. You want to enter a sensor-free environment, you pay. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but you can go in these camps now that are really popular in Silicon Valley, which is like the, exactly. yeah, I'm going to go into the woods and I'm not going to be able to take my phone. They collect your phone and they search your luggage to make sure that you don't have a phone. Couple other places, yeah. but yeah, no, it's uh, it's extreme there. Hey, look, the, the reality is, is that if I was in 1993 telling you that you'd have a portal to uh, the most information that the world has at your fingertips at any moment for no cost, you'd laugh. And in 2003, I said that you had that in your pocket, you'd laugh. And now I'm saying that it's going to be in the world around you. Don't laugh. Just look at how you can make it a part of what you're doing and take advantage of it. Because everyone else in the world is looking, but you've got something here. There's a big reason why I'm here as well. I think there's something here. And I think if you can find that combination where you can take those pieces and make it interesting for a real customer and solve a real problem, you have that thing that Norman was talking about, that magic. It doesn't matter if there's three of you in a garage. It matters what that core is. So find that core. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I, I, I was following actually the stats on the live stream and they spiked uh, like uh, lately. So that I think it was quite an interesting talk, yeah. Um, yeah, a few hundred people, by the way, while watching this li online, I think about 380 up to now since we started. Uh, good stuff. So let's get a break uh, and we'll have one more session after the break with Anish. He's actually going to get very practical and show you implementations of some of the ethical issues we really like talking around AI. We'll do a proper intro of a niche, but let's take maybe, let, let, let's come back at uh, five past nine and have a drink and maybe network a bit and have one kind of shorter session and then we will have a little bit more networking time if you'd like. Thank you.